Now back to the more interesting topic at hand, which is the future of the BBC licence fee. Uh, as you all know, in the run-up to the general election, Boris Johnson told an audience that he was looking at, in quotes, abolishing the licence fee. And earlier in the summer of 2019, the TPA found in polling that almost 70% of working class taxpayers want to scrap the TV tax, uh, which was a full 28% percentage points higher than support among uh, middle class cohort. And some of you may know that the TPA has also launched an Acts the Tax campaign, as we think the licence fee model is outdated and in need of an overhaul. And a part of that campaign is, of course, the decriminalisation of non payment of the licence fee. Uh, Nicky Morgan recently launched a consultation on that issue, and we intend to respond, and we want those who think non-payment should be decriminalised to join us in doing so. And on your chairs, um, you'll see information on how you can do that um, with the TPA support. Um, it's all accessible through our website, taxpayersalliance.com forward slash BBC underscore consultation but an annoying pop-up will get to you before you get to that page anyway. So to tonight's discussion, which is on a general view of the future of the licence fee, I'm thrilled to be joined by two distinguished guests who will have lots to say on the issue. First, Sir Robbie Gibb, former Director of Communications at Number 10 and former Head of BBC Westminster, and he'll be interviewed this evening by Mark Wallace, the Chief Executive of Conservative Home and, of course, a former Campaign Director of the Taxpayers Alliance. Um, we're at an interesting crossroads. The BBC is under pressure from modern broadcasters that utilise technology to stream content on demand. So how can the BBC adapt to the 21st century and new models of uh, broadcast? Mark will explore that and a lot more, I'm sure, with Sir Robbie, who's going to have a unique insight of working in the BBC and dealing with it in government. So, and then we'll have time for questions, of course, but for now, Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. John, um, as, uh, thank you also for that very kind invitation to be here this evening. Thank you all for coming, and, um, uh, and thank you for that very kind introduction. As you've noted, um, Robbie Gibb is now Sir Robbie Gibb, a Knight of the Realm. Uh, John Burko still isn't in the House of Lords. Um, those two facts, the second fact has nothing to do with the first. I just enjoy saying it out loud in, in public places. Um, but really, let's get started. Get down to brass tacks. You're aware, Robbie, of the TPA's campaign on this. You're aware of the salience of the topic. <coughs> Is the licence fee still sustainable in the modern age? Right. Um, firstly, I, I will take a position that is uh, somewhat nuanced. Um, if your position, um, and I suspect most of your position will in this room will be this, that you will not be satisfied with the BBC until it is privatised and it is a subscription model, I don't have anything to say to that, if that's your position. What I would just say that it's not, it, well, firstly, if you go to anywhere in the world, in a deepest African village, and ask what do you know about the United Kingdom, they'd probably say three things. Um, the Queen, David Beckham, news travels very slowly around the world, as you know, um, and the BBC. And to act in a way that at the end of the changes that, that some people support for purely ideological reasons, um, and you end up diminishing the BBC or, or, or driving it out of operation, I think would be an you know, incredibly unpatriotic position. Now, um, I just wanted to set out my stall personally, is you know, I'm a long-standing conservative. I'm not uh, a Chris Patton apologist type conservative. I'm a proper Thatcherite conservative um, that joined the BBC um, when I was in my 20s, having watched a programme on Newsroom South East, I don't think it exists anymore, about the NHS reforms that the then government, Tory government, were introduced that the reporter glibly described as privatisation. It wasn't a guest. This was uh, the BBC stating that NHS trusts were privatisation. And I took a view, you can take two positions. I could have spent the last 20 years sniping from the sidelines, complaining that the, what's the BBC got any right to license fee, or do what I did, is set about joining the BBC to put the case um, for impartiality, which I will return to ad nauseum over the evening, um, to basically to say that the only justification there is for a license fee is if for the BBC it to be a public sector broadcaster that provides something that the market is not providing, and that is 
impartial coverage. And one final thing to get off my chest because I don't forget to say it. If you, at the moment, uh, one of the main arguments for the license fee, and when I say license fee, it's not just a publicly funded entity, it has to be universal. It costs less to, for the individual's license fee for all the services that the BBC provide, it less than it costs to subscribe to a tabloid newspaper every day. And just think about that. Just parking the ideology, which I've asked you at the beginning, just park that for a moment, just in terms of value for money, for what you get. Because everybody pay, you get BBC One, two, three, four, News Channel, BBC Parliament, CBBS, CBBC, the iPlayer, one of the best accurate websites in the world, 32 local radio stations, Radio 1, 2, 3, 4, Radio BBC Alba, uh, we'll come back to that if you wish, um, three, uh, sorry, um, three national networks and 12 regional uh, centres. So just purely on the issue of value for money, the current system works. Um, if as my final point, then I can, we can move on to other questions. If you had a subscription model, by the way, the current technology doesn't allow for that, the free view doesn't allow non-payments to be turned off, but let's say you were able to have a system, and let's say half the population chose to subscribe to the BBC. So for those half that subscribed, if half didn't subscribe, if they were gonna have the same level of service, the license fee, the charge would be doubled. For the other half, a huge chunk of them would have suddenly not having the BBC that they have enjoyed all those years but have chosen to make a, a decision not to pay for it for whatever reason. And I suspect it will be a lot of elderly people that make this decision. I think people need to be really careful what they wish for. And, I, I'm, not just, and I'm not saying there aren't room for, for reform. I've got all kinds of things to say about that. But that's my opening position. Value for money. Um, international brand and be careful what you wish for. So there's an awful lot of things in there, but to, to, to try to pick, pick through them, I mean, technologically speaking, in terms of a changing media landscape, in terms of a, uh, a media landscape in which really the hallmark of all the gro growth areas in the media is one of choice and individualization and um, uh, building the kind of service that you might want to have rather than having, say, you know, the, the idea of other media outlets having an, an official called a controller, for example, is quite, it, it's quite emblematic in some ways. Is, it isn't, isn't the case, really, that the, the license fee just doesn't fit in the modern age? I mean, there used to be, the arguments you're talking about, used to be, there used to be a radio license. It would be peculiar now if we had a radio license, and we get all these radio stations to own a radio that you could turn on. You must pay a license that will go towards the BBC. That, that would seem anachronistic, isn't it? Well, somebody has, to, well, just take, just take the radio. Who's going to pay for the radio? You can't stop people tuning you don't pay so you'd have to have advertising and, and all the analysis if you had advertising on the BBC you would destroy ITV overnight now it's quite clear that you know if we, no one would come along and, and invent the BBC from where we are I'm taking a pragmatic position we have the BBC it does what it does um, it provides a service at a very very low price and the technology is, is not there to provide the, the opt-in service, even if you wanted that. In, in the current infrastructure, but it's, yeah. what, it's what, 10, 15 years since the whole infrastructure of delivering BBC television was changed to hmm. go digital to provide things like, do things like Freeview. You could do a switch over again, could you not? So most of the uh, technological solutions require internet uh, access, and you know, I'm sure people here are all on high-speed internet and Wi-Fi, but a lot of the population choose not to. My mother is not on the internet, wouldn't dream of being on the internet, and you know, she would basically be deprived from having BBC services. Um, so my, my, I just want to, almost like a question, and we can come back to, to here. If you, in your deepest heart, what is it about the BBC that people don't like? And I'm a unique person on this, is that I am the kind of person that would be a BBC critic. I'm the poor person that likely to be sitting there at Taxpayers Alliance. Um, I remember it being set up, set up and it was a, you know, a great thing and remains a great, a great thing. Um, 
I think it comes down to two things. One is, I think it's the issue of, of BBC bias. And, and it's, and it's, and it's the, I would say, the main, the main problem that the, that the Conservative Party and Conservative-leaning people have had for a long time is, is it's been news, it's been attitudes to immigration, it's, it's the you know, wokey-type drama scripts and the fact that com the comedians are always from the same perspective. All those areas, I think, are a major reason why people are concerned about the BBC. Secondly, the, you know, agreeing with you in many ways, you know, in the long run, the current funding situation where people pay a poll tax for access to a television seems anachronistic and out of date. All I would say is, I think it, it, it's clear that there needs to be reform in the long run, but unless it is a universal charge, however that's done, there's a range of different ways you could be taxpayers funded, you would have all the problems that I mentioned, is that you would basically kill uh, and destroy um, the BBC in its, in, in, in its current form. Now, some people don't mind that, but I think the British people would mind that greatly. Does there come a tipping point, though? So if you're in a situation where a reason to not implement, say, that technological switch over to something that's internet-reliant or you're primarily internet-based is because quite a large section of the user base, like, like your mother, the, the, the listeners and viewers, don't have access to that, is, is there, does there become a tipping point where the number of people, for example, who are currently accessing BBC services without paying the licence fee, perhaps more likely to be at the younger end, people using, ironically, the internet to do so, um, that, number, that, that group starts to outnumber the presumably diminishing number of people who don't have internet access, for whom, which, which is the current justification for keeping the system as it is. So, uh, so there's lots of sort of misinformation about the, the usage of young people of BBC services. I think when you ask people, do you watch the BBC, they think, they often think of BBC One. <laughs> They, they, I think the statistics are that 91% of the public consume some BBC content every week. Um, so it, it does have wide reach, but whatever, the, so the, the main, so it's, like, it's, like, it's a bit like a discussion that used to be having the Conservative Party about education um, or the National Health Service. You can, as the right and free marketeers, have only one solution to all public service issues, and that is how quickly you can get the public out of using public provision into the private sector. Well, I think there are lots of things that, and as we've seen from this government and, and, and previous Conservative governments, that actually Conservative thinkers and, and people from the right have a lot to say about how public services are run in the state sector. We've seen the transformation of schools um, and the health service whilst remaining in the public sector. So what I would like uh, to happen, I would like to see significant reform of the BBC in two main ways. One is in relation to impartiality. I've, my uh, view is that um, unless you prioritise impartiality across everything you do, and I mean by priority, it can't take second fiddle to breaking a story, it is the number one thing you do. So it means that commissioners for drama, commissioning in comedy and of course across all news outlets are thinking the whole time about impartiality. I'll give you a, a sort of a micro example of where unintentionally you know the BBC and other broadcasters can slip up. Uh, the BBC have a freedom of information unit and the freedom of information they ask questions of government bodies and they come up with some very interesting answers and of course once they get this original piece of journalism they put it on the radio and television. However if you don't control and think about impartiality at the point of commissioning, you can end up, or what you do end up, is that all these uh, questions they're putting into Freedom of Information are the effect of austerity on, their, on the number of libraries. And so each question in their own terms is a legitimate question and very interesting. But if everyone, if all the questions are from the same position, when it gets out the other end and it goes onto the bulletins, you've got all these bulletins, BBC, Freedom of Information says that whatever about, about austerity. So in order to stop that happening, you have to have, a, have to have at the point of commissioning a process of saying, actually, there are some Freedom of Information questions that can actually elicit not left-wing responses, that actually, let's have a look at what the effect of strike action in schools across the, the country have been on standards. And let's make a correlation between 
days lost and, and standards. There may or may not be anything in that. But that is driven by a desire from, from the conservative conservative leaning about when they have scripts in, in, in drama and they make I mean you were making this comment to me on the telephone about the Monday you can actually relate better than me the, the Monday of, of the general election yes it was a podcast a drama podcast I was listening to in, during the election campaign it was on and the Monday I think before the election an episode came out in which a, it was a sci-fi horror drama and a character randomly went on a little rant, rant about Brexiteers being stupid it's like it's a few days before the nation goes to vote, which would, I think, even if you have concerns about the BBC, aspects of BBC news sometimes, it would be pretty unimaginable to see a BBC mm. correspondent. Right, yeah, absolutely, absolutely impossible. The one, um, so there's, that, there's the impartiality bit uh, of it. The other part is having a, a long-term plan um, on the funding that moves towards 2027 when um, the charter is up for a renewal that looks at probably some kind of hybrid model where I think, you know, I probably disagree with, with, with you and the Taxpayers Alliance is I, I still think you need to have a licence fee, publicly funded, universal source of income for the BBC and then perhaps you can cap it at a certain level and then if, if the BBC need extra money they can have some charged services on top of that. So I think it's called a, a hybrid model and that is a way of of moving towards more of the model that I think is sustainable in the long run. But just on pure practical reason, wet reasons, if you have a different funding where people basically choose whether to subscribe to the BBC or not, you will basically, you know, if half the people subscribe, you would double the cost for people that did subscribe. I just don't think that is Moving the ideology aside, I just don't think that is the right thing to do. And in, by the sound of it, that's an argument against, from your point of view, decriminalisation. Well, de decriminalisation, I think, is an absolute red herring. Because, I mean, parking the fact that, I mean, w since when is it a good idea to make it easier for people not to pay and to increase the burden on law-abiding, decent citizens who pay their way? It seems to me, it, it, I think the estimates are, I don't know how they work this out, that it would raise the... the uh, it would, the BBC would lose £200 million in licence fee funding. So that's either a cut in services of corresponding £200 uh, million. Pounds, one, or, one Gary Lineker. That's uh, half, I, I say, half, <laughs> half, half, half a Gary Lineker. Um, um, or you raise the licence fee if that's possible. Now, it's, that is £200 million pounds coming from people that of basically consuming a service and not paying for it. I mean, I don't think that is the, the right thing to do. But doesn't that suggest that there's something missing or something mistaken about the argument you made earlier about the great value of the licence fee? You get all these, you, you listed the different yeah. outlets you get in the terms, but you compared it to the cost of subscribing to a tabloid newspaper. If this is such an invaluable service at such a fantastic price, why is it such a danger to the BBC, existentially even, to make it something that you allow people to choose to pay? Because I, I think all the estimates is, is that people, people won't. Well, firstly, it, technically, it, it can't work because you can't restrict people from access to the radio stations. You can't restrict people from the television services because of the technology. But even with that, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, it comes around 150-odd pounds you know, people don't pay. You know, whatever the estimate is, there, you have to admit there will be fewer people subscribing. Now, you can make guesses and estimates about how many fewer people would subscribe to the BBC if you could have a TV and not, cons and, and not pay. Um, I'm just giving you a pluck to figure out of the sky if it was half the population. You'd double the fee for people with no benefit to them whatsoever. So just on pure political grounds, it seems to me, you know, a crazy thing. And, the, and then in terms of... And just and, and a few facts about the... The decriminalisation, people say people go to jail. There's five people went to jail for non-payment of fines that consisted, that was in 2018, I think. Um, peop, and, and people, it's not that people don't pay the licence fee and go to jail. People don't pay the licence fee and deliberately and maliciously refuse to, um, to, to pay the fines of the court for non-paying. And at the last straw, they, there's there's a possibility of going to jail. It only happened in five cases in 2018, so it is a red herring. Um, before, I'll get into the question of bias, which I know you've mentioned a couple of times in, in a moment, but one last question in terms of that, that question of a hybrid model or reform. How, what does that mean for what public service broadcasting, maybe beyond the BBC, 
should look like in the 21st century. I mean, you, you already have a principle where some of the license fee gets divided to other broadcasters for public service functions. Should we have a system where there are YouTube channels that should be allowed to apply for an element of public service uh, broadcasting funding? Should there be should it be divided more generally? And where would you put that line cutting between the core BBC that you get for your license fee and the add-on? Because we've had all these debates about you know, BBC Foods, you'll remember the recipes were cut back a, a bit of years ago. Um, I don't really have a, a view. I don't think, you know, I'm probably I'm going to out Taxpayers Alliance you. I'm not sure we really should be increasing the scope of public sector broadcasting in that sense. Um, I mean, what, there's two types of public sector broadcasting, and, it, and it's worth just thinking about why the BBC has a, such a broad <coughs> scope of programming. The American public sector broadcasting takes a view that it just covers market failure. So areas that the market doesn't deliver, and then the public sector broadcasting in America will provide that. The view in the United Kingdom, um, and I can go into more detail about how that's delivered in terms of sport, is to make sure that, yes, it does that, and it should do that, but it also that every sector of society benefits from the license fee. So every demographic, every part of the country, there's something for everybody, because everybody has, has to pay. So it would be a bit much if there was a license fee, even if it was a smaller amount that everybody had to pay, that basically funded new services that only the middle classes enjoyed. So, you know, whether it be, you know, there's a whole discussion about Formula One and Rugby League, they're both sports outlets particularly consumed by a demographic that generally don't um, listen or watch the BBC. And so that was very important to the BBC to make sure that they kept those two areas. So um, I can see the argument that you, you, you have a, a sort of very bare bones, to coin a Brexit phrase, um, public sector service, but I think, I think it is better to have a service that the country can all think they've got a stake in, and you, and you add on to the sort of the, the general, you know, UK PLC, you've got a brand that um, is, a, is a good brand for the United Kingdom, particularly as we reach out to the world <coughs> um, with soft power and, and try to make a way in, in the wider world post-Brexit. Moving on to that question of bias or balance, you're unusual, relatively unusual, in, being, in having been kind of gamekeeper and poacher, mm. uh, running the BBC's political <coughs> output um, through to being director of communications in Downing Street. So you see this from both sides. How, what kind of bias do you see in action inside the BBC when you were there? So I've, I've um, <coughs> as I said, I joined the BBC because of my obsession with this issue <laughs> of bias, and I didn't want to moan about it, I wanted to do something about it. It's, it's quite a subtle concept. There's no question that particularly at the BBC, there's a, it is, it is very important to most journalists. And, you know, the people I've worked with closely for many years as their boss, I literally have no idea their voting intention or any of their sort of attitudes. It's quite, it's absolutely excellent. Um, there's a whole thing at the BBC is that you leave your politics at the door. I was a, a known conservative when I joined the BBC. That isn't a problem because you, you know, there's a culture of, you know, it doesn't matter, you use your expertise because you're involved in politics to provide impartial uh, political coverage. I mean, my, my concern is, 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 is multifaceted and actually the BBC in many ways are the least worst culprits for it. And, you know, we've all seen what, you know, Channel 4 News and, and I have to say Sky News and there's, there's lots of reasons for that, um, is, uh, I mean, I don't think the BBC is ever sort of pro-Labour, anti-Tory, or the other way around for that matter. I think what it is, is, well, I suppose it's, it's twofold. One is that there's a sort of groupthink view, is this whole dreadful concept, I don't think I know a single person who voted Leave type, type view. Um, there's also something about the way journalism works more generally, the, the effect of, of everything is, is a crisis, everything is a disaster, and the only solution are public sector um, solutions. The example I've, I, I have used for probably for 25 years, but I still think it is relevant. When there is a, a, a problem in a prison, if it is a state prison, a normal state prison, the basic default narrative for journalists, I don't know if it's been BBC, is that, you know, backed up by trade unions, that it is because there's not enough funding. There's some sort of 
austerity-based problem and low morale. If it is a private prison, the default position is because it's because of their ownership structure. It is unthinking. And to, to, I mean, one, of the, one of the things I uh, would definitely call on the BBC to do is to extend what they do in terms of diversity. You see diversity of getting more women on screen and behind the scenes, you know, more ethnic minorities, more, and, and so it represents the whole country. What you actually need, more than any of those things, is a diversity of opinion and views. And it's no point moving lots of output from metropolitan London to metropolitan Manchester. Is that you, there is literally no point. It, it's, it's utterly farcical. So, you know, attitudes to immigration is a, is, a, is a classic. So I just, I mean, I've monitored, you know, in terms of on Europe as well. It used to be, the BBC used to have this sort of language about anti-Europe was the phrase. And then BBC stopped, they called it Eurosceptic. And, and then they and then they got all that in order. Then then there was a, on immigration. There was a you know th there was this default position that immigration was anyone that was wanting to control immigration was somehow racist. And then BBC got their act together, and then they were in a better place. And then there was Windrush, and it went back to that. You know, it's a constant battle. Um, and so, but one of the things you have when you're at number ten <clears throat> in your phone is all the transcripts of every two-way done by every political correspondent. Um, and I, obviously you can't watch them all at the same time because you're in meetings and they all happen at the same time. But you can, you read them and, you know, the BBC, for all the criticisms, are in many ways the least worst option. And my, my biggest bugbear is, and this is, I suppose it's, it's less a biased right-left thing, it is a distorting factor, is the effect of social media on the conduct of reporters, correspondents and presenters that their whole, their whole audience is no longer the public out there trying to ask the questions that the public would love to ask if they happen to be in the room. It's all about getting a reaction from the Westminster Village. It's about the car crash interview. It's about it, you know, being sneery and rude in interviews rather than asking the questions that the public want. I mean, just one other thing I did say when I was at the BBC, uh, and I've said it when I was at no number 10 as well, an interview has got to work for three audiences. It's got to work for the programme, of course. They, it's very important they get you know, a good, a good uh, reaction for their programme. It's got to work for the audience, the public. It's also got to work for the politician. And if you got a situation that was happening like on the Today programme, well, it wasn't working for the politician. They couldn't, make, they couldn't actually get their message across. It wasn't working for the audience. It was only working for the programme, so they would have retweets. And I think you know, the government, this government are absolutely right to, to basically call them out on it kind of picture that you paint, which is something where it's not so much necessarily, it, it's not a kind of grand conspiracy you're by it's so an intentional kind of taking of one side or another, but a softer, uh, habitual or cultural, in some, you know, in, in some way social, and then reinforced by social media, kind of uh, en environmental factor. Is that harder to solve than a deliberate, you know, if you had to there's a deliberate, intentional attack? That might, might that be easier to take on and, and address than something which is more deep rooted in the actual structure of the I, I, don't, I don't actually think it's difficult. When I, I was editor of um, Daily, uh, Daily and Sunday Politics before my person, uh, Rob Burley, took over and abolished them in a very spiteful way. Um, uh, but yeah, but he's, he, he, you know, he's a truly great man. He's a truly great man. Um, is that during the Brexit, I want to tell you about the Brexit referendum. So I had a a system um, with, with my output editors on these programs is that you write your running order and your scripts and you put on a, remain, a metaphorical remain hat on and read it. And does it feel reasonable? If you're a remain person, does that running order feel reasonable? Not one remain story, one leave story, but does it feel fair if you're And then take the remain hat, put a leave hat on. Does that now feel fair from the other perspective? And if it doesn't, change it. And there's all kinds of things, loaded language, you know, cliff edge, you know, all these type of, you know, just don't do it. Because here's a, a revelation. Rem leave supporters pay the license fee as well as remain supporters. It's not just the Westminster Village. So it is doable. And the other thing, which I'm not sure has been widely reported, is that the reason why, and you probably forget, actually, during the referendum campaign, the, the BBC got quite a lot of plaudits for getting it right in terms of impartial coverage. And that is because the BBC prioritised impartiality. And we did that. We had these two um, working groups, committees, whatever they were, 
uh, one for news and one for the wider BBC, and I sat on both of them. And what it would do is that any commissions that were analysed and scrutinised through the prism of, of fairness for the same. And then I remember, and I, I think I got this right, is that on the wider television one, there was various commissions, comedy commissions, and there's one for, you know, Charlie Booker uh, commission on Brexit. And, you know, you can almost wince about how, what that's going to be like. And we just didn't do it. And so you, know, you can do it, but only if you prioritise it. If you just have it as part of the mix, is it, you nod in the direction. Um, I was at this... Um, conference, and this is a slight breach of confidence, but I'll say it anyway because it's more fun. Um, there was a, I was at this conference and I was chatting to a lady from Sky and we were talking about impartiality. She said, so due impartiality with an emphasis on the due part. Well, why? Um, emphasis on the, what about, impar what about emphasis on the impartiality bit? The due bit is a cop-out. It basically means that on certain subject matters, whereas there's, you know, you don't have to be, for example, what the due impartiality means, there's a terrorist attack and you've got people condemning the... You don't have to find someone in favour of the terrorist attack. That is what due impartiality... But they're quite rare. I mean, fundamentally, most issues, there are two sides to the story. And you should reflect it. It's not very difficult. It's not flipping rocket science. And the public want it. People are fed up. I have a thing about narrative journalism. I'm not interested in the view of the correspondent, whether it's a conservative or I want to know what's going on. I want you to tell me in the straightest possible and interesting form, and it's not about you as a correspondent. I mean, look at some of the correspondents' activity on Twitter. I'm not going to name any names, but I'm sure you can think about who you are. I just haven't had like one glass, a couple more glasses, and it's all out there. And I know that the BBC are about to launch a, a review into the use by staff of social media, not just in news, but across it. And, you know, Every person who works for the BBC and any public sector broadcaster, you know, th they have to behave in a way that recognises their salaries are paid for by the public and they want impartial coverage. They don't want to know what the politics are, you know, of Laura Coonsberg. I don't know what the politics of Laura Coonsberg. You, you can never, I wouldn't, you know, again, someone I know very well, I have no, genuinely no idea. I know she's Scottish. <laughs> you know, there's an excuse for the journalists in the audience. Um, but the, to mention Lord Kingsbury, it's, it's, it's a relevant example because the argument that you hear, the, the counter argument that you put, the kind of different defence is that, uh, that you often hear put, is that, oh well, as long as we're getting complaints from both sides, mm. that must be a sign of bias, almost a kind of almost a sign of balance, a, a double bias kind of defence in a sense. Mm. To what extent does that hold? You know, is there any validity to that argument, or is it the case that? There's, there's simply a difference between the bias that you might perceive coming from a, say, Tory perspective or the bias that Corbynites would allege about Lord Ginsburg. No, I, d I absolutely don't believe that is a fair... Uh, you can actually be biased against the Labour Party and biased against the Conservative Party at different times. And, my, and, I, and I don't actually think it is about particularly partisan bias. It's just a world view and an attitude. And it's, you know, I have this thing on today program sometimes is that they they would do the, the, by the way the radio for news bulletins uh, uh, on you know are as close as you can get in my view to impartial coverage in terms of straight uh, reporting but the interviews you just think about an interview on where does where does the presenter get their information so they come in like four or five in the morning they will have read the newspapers the newspapers will be looking for the most tendentious and, you know, and difficult areas to sell their newspapers. They're entitled to do, this, do so in a free society. The presenters will read those papers. They will then have an interview with a conservative politician and they will ask a series of unanswerable questions which are designed to be unanswerable. unanswerable. And they'll ask it to the minister and the shock horror, those unanswerable questions are unanswerable. And what does the presenter do? Feel it's exasperated by it. So, the whole thing is a complete waste of time and it ties back to, you know, to, I mean, you look this morning, of, um, the government, you know, relented and, and Matt Hancock popped up on the Today programme. Perfect type, it's very interesting, asking questions about what's actually happening, allowing the minister to set out his stall. That is neither a right or a left wing issue, it's just good broadcasting. So, so, but, 
but bias is not always right left it's certainly not conservative labor it's a sort of it's a, it's a world view it's a style of journalism that actually leaves the public cold and i think that one of the things that the bbc should do and other broadcasters is get back to delivering the type of interview and coverage that the public want. I'm sure there are a lot of questions in the audience, so two final questions from me before we, 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 we hear what people in the room have to ask. Um, that question you mentioned earlier, what was done during the referendum where you had one working group that focused on news and one that focused on everything else? I mean, everything else is not inconsiderable mm. when it comes to the entire BBC's commissioning output in comedy or culture or arts, or sport, etc. Um, how practical is it to extend <coughs> this question of balance and how successfully enforceable could it be on a long-term basis, particularly when you've got the question of, say, the arts world, which does not have a reputation for having a lot, a lot, of, a lot of out Tories. You, know, you, you can't put Jeff Norcott on every, every comedy show. There are, some, there are some. Who's the guy that does the 17.4 uh, million on, um, on Brexit? I can't remember his name. A bit crude, probably, for public sector broadcasting. We'll see you later. <laughs> um, so, well, I don't quite understand why drama insists on injecting politics into it. If you watch some of the brilliant American dramas, Breaking Brad, they don't have a certain line in there, something about Trump, do they? It's just about, it's just about the drama. So, I mean, part of that, you would, you know, if, you are, if you insist on your drama of, of putting in some political statements or plots, then you could have a scenario where, you know, you have to get permission to do that. I not, have not really thought of the practicalities of this. The BBC could, to do, could do a, a, an appeal to the sector, because a lot of these dramas are made by the independent sector, um, to come up with some original uh, dialogue that doesn't necessarily involve you know, Brexit and um, ge you know, gender reassignment. And, and my final question, <laughs> Did your, when you moved from the BBC to Downing Street, did your view on this change, and if so, how? Like, did, 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 did you think it, from your perspective, it seemed worse? Did it seem like it was, uh, did, did you find that actually Westminster thought it was worse than you knew it to really be from inside? Or, uh, no, on the specific impartiality issue, uh, no, nothing changed, because I was, a, well, at the BBC, I was a bore for Britain on this subject. I mean, there's quite a, I'm, you know, I'm not alone in, to, in the BBC of people who, who champion this issue. You know, I still have very close friends at BBC and we get together over a pint and we basically pat ourselves on the back about how great we are about impartiality. Um, it, it, and the BBC more generally is into, you know, very keen on impartiality. It's about prioritising it. It's about making it your number one mission. I mean, most journalists love the idea of breaking a news story. It's fantastic. It puts you at the centre of things. You feel you're doing your, you're going to journalism for that. I don't sure it's necessarily the priority of the public. And I think the BBC, and I believe all public sector broadcasters, should prioritise impartiality because that is the only way in the long run you can justify taking money compulsorily from the public. You've got to provide something that nobody else is, is, is producing. Thank you. Now, um, do we have a microphone to, to, to go to the audience? Um, just <laughs> Okay, um, I'll pick people out from the audience to ask a question. If you could say, um, speak very clearly and loudly and say who you are, uh, that would be much appreciated. I should say I'll also be using my tyrannical power that anybody who asks, uh, instead of asking a question, decides to deliver a speech, I will literally boo you. Um, and you'll all know you've said your name, and the video's going on the internet, so don't, don't do it to yourself. Um, uh, the, the gentleman uh, right at the back, uh, the line jacket. Uh, I'll just shout. Um, thanks for your thoughts, uh, Sorobi. I mean, I'm one of these people who first started thinking, you know, just give the whole thing. But you made some really good points. I'd just like to pick up on your last point about dramas in America, because I've been watching a lot of them, and link it up with what you were saying earlier about you would lose a lot of people who subscribe to the BBC. But why should only people in this country subscribe to the BBC? Why can't the BBC compete with the rest of the world? You might find producing better dramas. There's a brilliant thing I've been watching on Sky recently, The Outsider, which is America. If they were forced to compete with that sort of thing, instead of, like you say, pumping their politics into it, they could get more income from global subscriptions rather than just isolating in this country and, and charging poorer people money rather than expanding the world and making make better programs. To so in summary, could the licence fee mm. uh, be sold globally? <clears throat> no, it's, it's, it's an interesting, 
I mean, idea. I mean, you've got some brilliant BBC dramas, and I was before I came here thinking, what is my favourite BBC drama? And Line of Duty. Um, Line of Duty, from my point of view, is like perfect drama. It's not left wing. <laughs> um, it's amazingly enjoyable, and it sits on Netflix, and so they must get BBC must get money from from there. And actually, there is a, actually a, a scene in. Um, in Line of Duty, which not only is, is actually amazing, where they, where the, uh, the who's the, the lead um, actor in, in Line of Duty, the, the guy from North, the guy from Northern Ireland, and uh, yeah, he's absolutely absolutely superb. And he, he was accused of having a, a, a sexist employment, uh, you know, uh, track record, and actually turned the whole thing around. It turns he hadn't at all, you know, which is amazing and actually very unusual that someone had taken that sort of. That sort of that sort of approach. You can do it. It's when I talked about a hybrid model. Find. I mean, there are the BBC do have other sources of income um, already. Um, I mean, is that what you mean? You're not a, a world license fee that we could go around charging the world compulsory license fee. I don't think it would be. You could easily do that. That's yeah. a good thought. I'm, I'm aware we've got a limited amount of time for questions. So let's take two questions. Uh, so the, the, the lady in the front here and then uh, John Strife. Hello, I'm Amy Harris. Um, you said um, just a moment ago about that the BBC needs to get back to impartial reporting of the news, just the genie is out of the bottle. Um, so my question is, how do you put that genie back in the bottle? And John Strife. you put your emphasis on impartiality. Um, but uh, the problem is that there's no accountability of the BBC. How, if you want to get back to that position of impartiality, can, can we do it? It's, it's taxation without representation. And I put uh, two points. I put a, uh, to Nick Robinson how the BBC was biased about climate change. And he didn't try to defend mm. impartiality. He said, oh, well, it has a nuanced uh, approach to uh, climate change. Mm. Uh, but there's a big conservative the poll this week. 70% of conservatives uh, do not think there's a climate emergency. That it, position is not represented on the BBC at all. And the final point is Tony Hall said uh, that uh, if equal numbers of conservatives, equal numbers of Labour uh, complaining, that demonstrates impartiality. What he forgets is that when somebody like Emma, uh, Emma Barrett on Newsnight is on the programme interviewing uh, somebody, before that person's got past their first sentence, she's spouting off her own views. It's nothing to do with the interviewee of trying to get information out of it. She just spouts off. <laughs> <laughs> Related questions there. How they are, yeah. Gene back in the bottle. How, once, <coughs> once something like impartiality is, is in trouble, how do you restore it? And, and might accountability to, you know, maybe, maybe even, you know, should there be elections? Should, if it's our BBC, should we get to elect the people who oversee it? So I actually think the BBC, you know, is impartial. Um, I think people, it is let down by individuals. Um, you know, just take, you know, I don't want to name names, but, you know, let's just take. You know Chris Mason, or you know, you know Adam Fleming. These people, you know, I just want to tell you what's going on. Ian Watson. I don't want to name too many because it looks like everybody else are biased. I don't think that at all. Um, you know, the, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, um, so I, I, it's it's about it's about really just rebooting it. I mean, when I was at the BBC, there was a huge when, when change of head of news, and there was a big thing about people came from newspapers where the, the most important thing in a newspaper is to break a story because you've got the very competitive, you know, your front page splash, great new story. That is not what, you don't need to do that at the BBC. You've got your money. What people want to do is tune in at 10 o'clock news, you know, or whatever, and you've got really well produced, impartial, you know, non-sneery, where's John? Yeah, non-sneery type of questions where you don't have any sense of their personal. You know, I don't care what Emma Burnett's views are. You know, if, if she wants to become a, a commentator, become a commentator. 
So in, in relation to account, the trouble with account, the accountability issue in the way that you suggested is to try to make it, uh, it needs to not be a political, it mustn't be, people must be fearless when you make your, do your broadcasting. Um, to have it linked to elections, I don't think would work. There is a board and the board chairman is appointed by the Secretary of State in the government. So there is a connection. Um, but what you, what you, you know, there is a charter and I think the government needs to, you know, make it absolutely clear that, you know, the new chairman coming after Sir David Clementi and the new uh, director general, that they absolutely put impartiality absolutely right back and forget, or not, not forget everything else. I mean, I was interested in your, your reaction. I talked about diversity and you're getting, you know, get, yeah, you're getting rather sort of agitated by that. And I, I, can, I can understand that is what actually I think, if I can suspect what your position is, diversity at the expense of getting the right person. You want the right person on the panel, not chosen, and it's absolutely right. But it's also important that the people that appear on screens and behind the screens are, represent the people that pay the license fee. I mean, otherwise it's absurd. It's like something from the 1950s. You've, um, and what was your other, you made another point. Oh yeah, about the, yeah, look, I, I absolutely 100% agree with you. I don't, I just don't think presenters should be doing those long spiels. They're, just, they're there to ask the questions the public would love to ask had they had the opportunity to sit in front of Michael Gove. As I think it used to be, yeah. The kind of thing you get at Taxpayers Alliance in conversation with the members. <laughs> um, so the, the gentleman here, uh, and then Jonathan Isby, um, moving right across the room. Well, I, uh, um, Andrew Schofield, um, do you think there's a certain irony or even a poetic justice to the fact that 50 years ago, when I was a kid, and the viewers had no choice, and there were only three channels, the BBC fulfilled its public service obligations far better than today, the 21st century, when viewers have unlimited choice, and they're exercising that choice, and they're saying, no, we're going to go else, elsewhere, because you're not, you know, <laughs> so... I can see the irony. Uh, Can I answer that one? Uh, yeah, that, that, that. Uh, Jonathan, Lisby, I, I'm unique in this room, I think actually probably unique in the world, in that I've worked for both the BBC and the Taxpayers Alliance. All this, I left the BBC in 2003. I wanted to ask a kind of, a practical question actually about complaints. One of the things that I was fascinated by when I worked with BBC was looking at the kind of audience blogs of complaints that were made each day about programmes. And what struck me was actually how few people seemed to complain uh, about issues of, of bias and, and so forth. I wondered, you've obviously worked with BBC more recently than I have, you know, what are those numbers in your experience and how how many complaints have to be made about a specific program or incident for editors and senior people to take notice of them? And is there any value, uh, or do you think it would be counterproductive for there to be almost coordinated efforts to make complaints about specific issues? So two questions there, one very broad, one, that, that question of the irony of the BBC perhaps getting less mm. good in its public service salaries, just as competition has flourished. Um, and secondly, from I think they're always unique, Jonathan Isby. Yeah. You've you, you not noticed any employment history. Um, question about uh, the complaint system. I think you're right in saying that BBC journalists often directly, personally receive information about the complaints. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I, I'll discuss uh, both of those. So, in terms of the, so one of my, so basically, I think what's happened in the last over this period of 50 years. I can't believe that you were a kid at 50 years ago. Surely not. Um, <laughs> is that it's the, it's the Westminster Village churn, um, is that you, you know, that journalists on broadcasts in newspapers are sort of competing with each other and the differentiation between on social media and then what appears on broadcasts in newspapers becomes less defined, that is a BBC person, that is a newspaper person, because it, it's a sort of, it's like a public choice thing. It's, it's, what are the motives for the individual? So the motives for the individual, you know what it's like when you, I don't know if you're on Twitter, and I, you do a tweet and it gets retweeted. It's rather exciting and it gets engaging, isn't it? And you know, when, when a, a journalist, you know, the BBC tweets something, the more tendentious you are, 
the more you get retweets and reaction. It's just a nat natural thing. I think that the trouble is it bleeds into the Westminster Village and social media and, and competitiveness and, and careers all get mixed in. And actually, if I had it my way, I would, I would have basically most broadcasters off Twitter and, just, and social media. I just don't think any business. It stops them focusing on the next bulletin. It's about them providing twi every twist and turn of every bit of story, and they keep getting themselves into trouble. Um, and Jonathan's uh, question. Like, so it's not the numbers. So generally what happens is very few people will complain about it. The Daily Mail or somebody will write a story about the complaints, and suddenly you've gone from five complaints to 5,000 complaints. Um, so my, I have a sort of general view when I was an editor of the BBC is that people that complain are broadly right, as my general, general def starting position, because um, people don't go around complaining just for the sake of it. Often people don't, I mean, the biggest complaint I had when I was at BBC was the amount of airtime I gave to UKIP. And I spend a lot of time explaining the rationale for that. And the rationale is for, if you had a situation where you only gave airtime for the incumbent parties, <coughs> then you could never have a new entrant enter into the market. So as you know, that the formula was that you gave, you made judgments about the level of coverage based on past and present levels of support and past, past meant two electoral cycles, um, present means opinion polls and the number of candidates. So you make a general judgment. And the idea that UKIP winning European elections should get no coverage is utterly absurd. And, and that's, you know, but people didn't understand that and people would complain about that. So I spent a lot of time explaining um, that, that process. And I think that's also very important that editors are open and transparent and treat license fee payers with respect and courtesy because they pay your, pay your wages. Um, I think it's about the quality of the complaint. I think Ofcom should do more in terms of impartiality. I think they seem to have backed off quite a lot from that. It's quite, it's quite often a, a, it's quite subjective, you know, unless you have, you know, to know this is a biased report. It's quite hard to nail it. You see it, you know it when you see it, but it's quite hard if you're mechanistic about it. Um, and lots of the public don't really, you know, they don't like the report. That's generally not necessarily means that the report should not have, have, not have happened. But I was always very open to anyone that, that, that um, managed to get hold of me and complain about it. And generally I take a position as they're probably right. So uh, the gentleman here in the blue check shirt and the gentleman. <coughs> Hi, I'm Helen. Do, do you think the government's uh, current communications approach towards the BBC is too aggressive and at risk of actually alienating rather than galvanising public support? Um, my name is Mark De Stefano. Uh, I'm from the Financial Times. The, um, I always find it interesting when we talk about the people on Twitter very much from one way. I think one of the problems this discussion doesn't include is Andrew Neil, who is very aggressive on Twitter and, and he's very doesn't hide his own political beliefs uh, and he doesn't have a full-time contract at the BBC he's a contractor but I would just want to know from your perspective do you think <coughs> you're a good friend of Andrew's should Andrew get off Twitter so two questions there again just for the benefit of viewers at, at home um, firstly the question is the government's approach is, is the right one you've touched on that a little bit mm. in terms of the Today program the, the, the response um, and secondly for a question from the Financial Times should mm. Andrew Neil uh, get off Twitter uh, so in terms of the government um, approach, I think, um, you know, I think it's the right thing to do is where a, where a program doesn't fulfill the three criteria that I suggested, um, then the program's not working for the government and therefore the audience. And if it forces the program to think again and say, actually, it's got to fit. Look, there's lots of discussions. And when I was at I've had lots of discussions with senior managers, and you know, it's probably the BBC. It's, it's not like it's a bit of a national health service. It's not the Secretary of State can't pull a lever and everyone just jumps. It doesn't really work like that. There's lots of sort of slightly anarchistic people doing their own thing. Um, but I think if, if I think it is right, and I think um, I think we will see, you know, changes, you know, in, in broadcasters as they'll need to do to, to attract the government to participate. And I don't think the government are trying to stop them asking tough questions. I just think they want to make sure they ask the questions the public 
want and allow them a, a, you know, a fair hearing. In relation to, the unique thing about Andrew um, is that you know, you've got like hundreds and hundreds of you know, biased journalists from, from the left and people say, oh yeah, but what about Andrew Neil? You know, the thing about Andrew Neil is that he is fearless from all angles. Um, he, will, he, he will take on people from the right and from the left. He's one of the, he's one of the journalists that it's almost like an exception in relation to the level of work that he puts into his interviews. And you can't say that when he does his interviews with the party leaders, um, when, I was, when I was there in 2017, Theresa May got as tough a, a ride as uh, Jeremy Corbyn, as Ni Nicola Sturgeon. Um, so, you know, he, 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 he's well researched, it's not opinionated, and so um, I reject your premise. How, how about his, just, just to follow up on that, how about his Twitter content though? Because if, is he one of those people you were kind of talking about earlier where what he does on air could be completely within the spirit and rules of the BBC, but what he does online becomes a kind of different, it is a different thing. And that could, even, <coughs> I don't know his relationship to retweet based dopamine, but you know, that, that, that question of, kind of the social media. Look, I mean, you know, Andrew is a, is a, is a phenomena, and he's a phenomena on air and on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, we're going to do the last two questions. Um, uh, there's been a very patient gentleman here on the aisle and the lady here. Um, I've heard what you said about um, the variety and the value for money of what we get from the BBC's um, large repertoire. And uh, yes, that's quite correct. That being the case, why is everyone so scared that in a competitive world they couldn't hold their own if they're that good a value for money? You also said that charging, um, it could be selective charging, a bit of a pick and mix, um, is not typically possible. I, I query that because when Freeview started, there was a thing called top up TV. So I suggest um, if you wanted to do it, it could technically be done. How do you convince me that the newsroom is not left wing? Um, the reason that I asked that was because over Brexit, it clearly showed that it was uh, Remainer. Um, when I left school many years ago, my first job was at the BBC. And whatever your position was, and I was just a secretary, you went to the BBC training school for a week, and it was dinned into you that the BBC was impartial. <laughs> And also, everybody nowadays says, if you want a job at the BBC, you go to the Guardian and look for a Thanks, Caroline. The, the first of those questions was something I asked during the interview, yeah. so we'll, we'll fit in one more question. I think there was one down the front. Uh, yes, John. Ken Worthy, what would you just say to a BBC that was about half its present size? I mean, does it, for example, need so many TV channels? Does it need all those local radio stations? Couldn't the private sector provide? So can you convince yeah. Caroline, former BBC employee, that the newsroom really isn't left-wing? And <laughs> does the BBC really need all of those channels that you, you listed earlier? Or could it, could it come back? Um, I don't actually know necessarily what people's politics are in the newsroom, but I can imagine that there will be less Brexity than this room. Just guessing. Um, hard to imagine. <laughs> just, you know, out there. Look, I mean... I believe in the diversity of opinion as well as the other sets of diversity that we're all more familiar with. Um, you know, having people from different perspectives and different insights is, is important. But I think most important is prioritising. I'm going to get boring on this. If you prioritise impartiality and you just bang on about it in the way that you were describing back in the day. Look, the BBC does go on about impartiality, and they do, but probably not enough, and it needs a sort of a reboot to uh, bring it back. Now, just in terms of the scope of the BBC, I think it's... It, um, oh, just the, 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 top, the second part of the question, by the way, my position about um, a hybrid is you can do additional services. So I actually do agree with you can do, it as long as you keep the universality, which allows you to keep the price down. Um, you could, I suspect, I mean, one of, the, one of the sort of... There's no reason why... Or just take the local radio. Um, local radio is really, really important speech. It doesn't provide the same as what the uh, commercial local radio does. It, it's mo mostly speech, and that's one of the rules for the local radio. They can't, they're not just going to be playing 
song, so they, they, they do speech that the private sector is not providing, and it is listened to by a lot of elderly retired people in, in local communities and, and crucial ways of communicating. I don't think the private sector would produce, uh, as they haven't done, um, that local radio. A um, lot of the BBC's services are interconnected, so some people say, well, why don't you close a news channel? Because you've got, you know, massively expensive. The, the, the thing is, is that the most of the costs are the news gathering. Um, the newsroom makes news items for across the entire BBC range of output. So you don't it's quite interconnected, which is the first point. Take Radio One, which is one of the people people cited. People, you know, I don't listen to Radio One, but I'm reliably informed <laughs> that um, Radio One is not like Heart FM or Capital FM. It doesn't just play the same hits it plays original new bands. And my understanding from those that know this type of thing, um, that a lot of new bands only make their break because of, of Radio 1. So it is important that, that the BBC do provide in all their services something that the private sector isn't producing. I'm not necessarily, look, I quite like that there being a range of, decent range of services. I want like more services, not BBC to be bigger. If, if, if you can keep the price less than the price of a tabloid newspaper, that's obviously not bad going, but obviously I probably, uh, it's less of an expense for me than, than, than some people on a, on a, on a low fixed income. Um, look, there are different ways you could have the license fee more generally. You could, you could have it means tested, you could do a whole range of different things. My only thing that is, to me, absolutely crucial is that you have a universal fee because that allows you then to keep the price for everybody down. Because if only like a quarter of the people subscribe, then the thing is so much higher. And we end in that sense where we began. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that's been a fast I hope you'll agree that's been a fascinating hour on a topic which is only going to become more controversial and, and, and more topical in the years to come. Um, thank you to the Taxpayers Alliance for hosting us. Thank you to all of you for coming and for your questions. And finally, please join me in thanking our guests, Sir Robbie Gibb.